Catch the Fire, a book written by Goodheart Obi Ekweme, narrated by Ofi Ejembi. Chapter 1 God Seekers Wanted Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. James chapter 4, verse 8. Many things happening around us in the world today point to a most delicate time in the history of mankind. We would be fooling ourselves to assume that everything is normal. The events of the world today authenticate the various prophecies in the Holy Writ about the last days. It behooves us, therefore, as diligent students of the Word and followers of Christ, to rightly interpret the times and the seasons as it is written of the sons of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were two hundred, and all their brethren were at their commandment. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32 The ability to discern the times and to know what to do are prerequisites for the dominion of the saints in the times we live in. What sets the wise apart from the foolish is simply that they know the right thing to do at the right time. The scripture in Matthew chapter 25 gives us an account of ten virgins where five were set out as wise and the other five as foolish. Now, they were all virgins. I assume that they were all committed Christians, tongue-talking and demon-casting saints. The marked difference between the two groups as illustrated in the story is preparation. Preparation is something done in advance or in anticipation of an event. In preparation, one sets out to do things that are not in correlation with the status quo. In fact, many times, the undiscerning wonders at the irrelevance of the steps being taken by his wise neighbor. When you're preparing for the future, people around you don't seem to see the connection between the immediate circumstances and what you are doing. The wise virgins prepared by getting extra oil for their lamps. They foresaw that the time would come in the near future when it would not be as easy to get oil, so they paid the price of getting some extra bottles in reserve. I think their neighbors laughed at them for denying themselves of what was in vogue and purchasing unpopular items. They must have appeared fanatical to the foolish virgins. Amos chapter 8 says, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 13. There's a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Know that it doesn't say a famine of preaching the word, but of hearing the word. There's a scarcity of the true gospel in our days. There's a gospel that draws men to God. There is a gospel that makes men uncomfortable in their shortcomings and lukewarmness. There is a fiery gospel that engulfs men with love and passion for God and for the establishment of his kingdom on earth. That kind of gospel is scarce in our day. Jesus said very clearly, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39. The second coming of Jesus Christ is likened to the sneaking in of a thief in the night. Jesus will show up when people least expect his arrival. I have a witness in my spirit that the Master is right at the door now. The one thing I think is delaying his arrival is his mercy and compassion to see many more come to his saving knowledge. Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. Oh, how the world needs to hear the gospel of the kingdom today. I'm talking about the kind of gospel in the fashion of Paul's who said, 
My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Quite a lot of what goes on in our media today, which has so filled their airwaves, do not pass for the gospel of the kingdom. The preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is naturally backed up with divine energy and manifestations of the Spirit of God. That is the kind of gospel that will usher in the second coming of Christ. The preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is a reminder that the coming of the Lord is near. Again, the five wise virgins did something in the present that was not required for today. When the bridegroom's arrival was announced in that parable, it was midnight, and it was then that the five foolish virgins realized their gross error. The foolish virgins ventured to borrow oil from the wise, but they were denied. The truth is, personal oil cannot be borrowed. It has to be purchased by making personal deposits. You may borrow vessels, but you cannot borrow oil. Buying connotes an exchange for the desired commodity. Beloved, there is a price tag for the oil that God has in stock for you. The cost for the oil required to make you ready for the master's return includes 1. Passion Your passion is the primary currency to procure the oil you need to keep you trimmed and bright to welcome the master back. God is not a waster. He will not cast his pearls upon swine. When he sees a man genuinely hungry and thirsty, he pours out his treasures into him. Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God will only deposit his treasure in those who value it. You need to express a deeper level of hunger and thirst before the Lord today. You need an earnest desire for his righteousness and to see his glory. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Psalm 42 verse 1. David cried, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Psalm 84 verse 2. God is waiting to unleash his power and his glory upon that soul that would take a hold of his altar again and cry like Jacob, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. The man Jacob was so desperate that he wrestled with an angel all night till his change came. Jacob could go that far because he had value for spiritual things. Today, the church overflows with increasing numbers of people whose interests and cravings are for temporal possessions and carnal aggrandizement. You need to decide your own camp. The Holy Ghost charges us to spiritual diligence. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 15 through 17. Esau is described here as profane. By the time he realized his loss, it was too late. He found no place of repentance, though he sought for it carefully with tears. That is the fearful side. There's a time to seek God, and I believe this is the time. Prophet Isaiah said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6. I charge you, my reader, by the Spirit of grace, awake and seek the Lord now. This is your finest hour to experience Him and to be decked with His glory. Don't delay. You will be all of men most miserable if God by His ordination places a material like this in your hands and you miss out on the current wave of the glory being brought upon the church. God is raising an army such as never has been before. Yes, we have read of men and seen a couple of them in our time who showed forth God in His holiness and power, but they don't compare with the manifestation that shall be in the days ahead of us. We shall see more demonstration of the Spirit that go beyond casting out devils and the shadows of men healing the sick. Mark my words, beloved. Heaven is currently enlisting this end-time army of God carriers, and right now, induction programs are running to prepare and position the rank and file of the footmen. Scores of them are rising from various parts of the world, and God's eyes are still running to and fro. My earnest prayer 
is that he will find you too in Jesus' mighty name. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. The call is being made today to all men. This medium is another platform of the master calling, but the chosen are those who answer the call. You can get enlisted today by answering the call to be in the number. God is not a respecter of persons. He calls everyone equally, but he chooses only those that answer his call and drive themselves to meet the demands of God. If you are left behind in this move, you have nobody to blame. Demas lost out on his apostolic privileges because he loved this present world. Paul lamented with compassion, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed from Thessalonica. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 People's love for this present world will debar them from being enlisted in the end-time army that God is raising. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. The love of the Father and the love of the world are mutually exclusive. The love of the Father and the love of the world can survive in the same heart, just like light and darkness cannot coexist. It is interesting to note that when you make God and His kingdom your utmost pursuit, the things you need for life and godliness pursue after you. Jesus did not mince words in making this clear in His teaching. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, Whither withal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. Set your priorities right. When you begin to seek after God, good will begin to seek after you. God seekers are simply blessed. They don't seek blessings, rather blessings seek after them. God is not against you having a portion of the world's goods. He delights in the prosperity of his saints. I pray that God gives you an understanding of his principles for the supply of your needs. I dare you to prove him. Dr. David Oedipo said, God is all you need to have all your needs met. How true! You can't seek God sincerely and go without. God is earnestly seeking for men who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, through whom He can reveal Himself to the world in these end times. I can hear the cry of the Spirit echoing across the entire globe. Where are the Davids of this generation? David was one man of whom God Himself gave this testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart. Acts chapter 13 verse 22. What a testimony. There is nothing wrong with having the gold and glamour of this life. David had them all, but the most outstanding witness was heaven's acknowledgement of his passion for God. No wonder he could single-handedly give more than all the entire nation of Israel contributed towards building the temple. He was sold out to God and all that he had was used to serve God. Beloved, there is much more to this life than this life. When you live for eternity, you win both in this life and in the hereafter. There is a stark difference between the five wise virgins and the other foolish ones, just like there was between Moses and the children of Israel. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20 verses 18 through 21, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. The children of Israel at the sight of the glory of God's presence removed and stood afar off. The children of Israel applied for an intermediary between them and their God in the same way that many people parading the church would rather have a prophet tell them what God is saying 
then approach God to hear for themselves. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. John chapter 10, verse 27. Number 2. The fear of God. In verse 18 of Exodus 20, the people removed and stood afar off because they were afraid. Yet in verse 20 of the same scripture, Moses admonished them, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces. Clearly, there are two kinds of fear. There's a kind of fear that brings torment, such as satanic. The virtuous fear refers to reverence for God and His Word. This is the kind of fear that keeps our hearts and souls in His love. When you reverence God, your struggle with sin will be over. By mercy and truth iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. Proverbs 16 verse 6 When the fear of God is in your heart, you are not advised, cajoled, and pampered to live right. You simply depart from iniquity. It is the fear of God that makes a man abstain or flee from every appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 The fear of God is best learned by hearing His word than by His judgment and wrath. Please, don't wait for certain calamities to strike before you respond to call. Peter the Apostle warned, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 Those who encounter God automatically rever Him. A Christian who is falling short of the fear of God has not truly encountered God. If you have seen the light of His glory, you will not take Him lightly. Isaiah the prophet broke down before God's presence, crying, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. The glory of God's presence makes you see how wretched you are. Characteristics of God seekers 1. They seek to please God. One clear attribute of God's seekers is a constant desire and commitment to please God at all times and in all things. True God seekers are bond servants of the will of God. They understand that they are redeemed from the slave market and are owned by God. Like Paul the Apostle said, Ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 the irony is, if God doesn't own you, you remain a slave to the devil. It doesn't matter your station, status, or possession, you remain a slave to the devil if you don't crown Jesus as king over your life. Interestingly, when you subscribe to the Lordship of Christ, you become an heir of God and joint heir with Christ. You can't enjoy true freedom until you choose to be bound to Christ. To enjoy liberty, your will must be subjected to his own will. The prodigal son had to be reduced to a wretch and a loafer who craved to share in the meal he was employed to serve to pigs before he learned that true freedom is in being a servant to the Father. The truth is, God wants to lavish his wealth and resources on you so that through you he can establish his kingdom and righteousness on earth. But you must be first of all free from a childish, prodigal mindset. When he truly owns you, you'll access all that he owns. 2. They prioritize God True seekers of God prioritize God and the things of God. They live by Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. True God seekers naturally give God their very best and make him have the first place in all their life's choices. 3. They set their eyes on eternal rewards. True God seekers primarily set their eyes on things of eternal value and not on the temporal. They are motivated by principles of eternity. As it is written, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3 Verses 1 through 3. Number 4. They are passionate for God and His kingdom. True God seekers are zealous and passionate about God. 
David, the old-time seeker of God, testified, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Psalm 69 verse 9 And Apostle Paul in his charge to the saints in Rome said, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 Serving the Lord has to be with fervency. 5. They love and carry divine presence. True seekers of God carry a tangible fragrance of God's presence. By reason of time they spend in fellowship and communion with God, the aura of God's glory surrounds them. 6. They press to higher levels of consecration. True God seekers are constantly pressing towards higher levels of consecration. They take heed to the charge, let thy garment be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 8. The oil on your head is in direct proportion to the whiteness of your garment. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9. You cannot be more anointed than you are righteous before God. The more consecrated and whitened your garment is, the more oil is poured upon your head. 7. They are a people of the cross. True God seekers understand what it means to carry their cross and follow the Master. Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 8. They are developed in the reverential fear of God. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines, and break down the wall of Gath, and the wall of Jabna, and the wall of Ashdod, and built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelt in Garbael and the Mehunims. And the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 5-8 through 8. As we see in the example of Uzziah, God-seekers are prosperous people. You simply can't be seeking the Most High and end up low. Seeking God recommends you for His help, which guarantees all-round victory. There is a note I want to make here about the man Uzziah. From the foregoing consideration, God prospered him while he sought after him. But Uzziah soon forgot the arm that took him up, which was holding him high. He discontinued the things he was doing which made God stand for him. This is a common pitfall in the school of power. Men tend to be desperate when they realize their emptiness and need, and when they get some respite, they easily fall back. Further, in Uzziah's account, the Bible says, He made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks, to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 15 and 16 We must consciously contend the error of Uzziah as we begin to see the marvels of God's helps in our lives in response to our resolve to seek him. Uzziah was overtaken by pride. He went out of order to engage in duties that only priests were consecrated to perform. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord, that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. 
And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from thence, yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death, and dwelt in a several house, being a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord, and Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 17 to 21. Uzziah started well but did not finish well. My prayer is that you will start and finish well. May your testimony be after the order of Paul who testified, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you, while ye be with him, and if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel had been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without law. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oda the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin, and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul, that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice, and with shouting, and with trumpets, and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire, and he was found of them. And the Lord gave them rest round about. Second Chronicles chapter 15 verses 1 to 4 and 8 through 15. At any point you resolve to turn from your own ways and seek the Lord, God will always make it a memorial by stretching forth his hand to wipe away your reproaches. At what point you choose to seek after God, good will come after you. It is now over to you. Chapter 2 Spiritual Heart Check The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. The New Living Translation renders it thus. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. For as the man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. The biological heart plays a vital role in keeping man alive and supporting the proper function of the entire human anatomy. The heart can be adjudged as the most important organ of the body. Man may manage and survive the failure of some other organs of his body, but a heart failure is life failure, which means death. Just as the physical heart is crucial for the survival of man, the spiritual heart in similar manner is very important to the spiritual well-being of every child of God. This is fundamental because the spiritual controls the physical. I sat before a wise man of God several years ago when my health was challenged and he said to me rather prophetically, 
If your spiritual heart does not fail you, your physical heart cannot fail. It is quite unfortunate that the Christianity of today does not pay adequate attention to the sustenance and development of this vital aspect of the believer's life. Medical science has been able to proffer ways and means to keep the physical heart strong and healthy, and many of us subscribe to their advice, especially when we advance in age, by paying close attention to our diet, regular exercises, and several other precautious routines. The Holy Bible generally uses the English word heart to mean different things at different times based on its context. It refers to the human biological heart, soul affections, the mind, human nature, and the conscience. However, two broad ways the scriptures use the word heart is to refer to the spirit of a person and the innermost part of the soul. The Holy Bible presents the heart as a part of man that goes through the phases of metamorphosis, especially when such a person gets born again. The heart goes through stages of transformation, but the same is not true with the human spirit. The moment a person gives his life to Jesus Christ and is born again, his spirit is instantly recreated. The spirit of man is not mechanized, repaired, or adjusted. Rather, it is reborn. The Bible calls it a new creation. If you are in Christ, you are in Christed, and your spirit is one that never existed before. In a great sense, your spirit, as a child of God, is one and same with the Spirit of God. Your spirit carries God's DNA. On the other hand, your soul and your body do not go through radical transformations like your spirit experiences. The soul goes through a process of change, growth, development, and maturity. As you look into the perfect law of liberty, God's word, you behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 The change is not happening to your spirit per se, but rather to your soul. Your spirit was rebirthed once and for all by the Spirit of God, but your soul is, for lack of a better expression, a chip off the old block. It needs to be purged, schooled, and matured. There are generations of garbage that we inherited in our souls that must be dealt with. Talk of mindsets, cultural beliefs, worldly fads, and other carnalities that barricade the vibrancy of the spirit's expression. Your soul occupies a very cardinal position in the alignment of the spirit, the soul, and the body. The soul is an interface or umpire of sorts that determines your swinging to the spirit's inclinations or to the pull of the flesh. The soul can be spiritual or carnal. Paul talks about being spiritually minded and being carnally minded. I strongly believe that the heart of a man is not located in the spirit of the man, but in his soul, where change, growth, and development takes place after the new birth. Romans chapter 12 verse 12 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The soul needs to be weaned from the ways and methodologies of the world system. The transformation of the man in the context of the above scripture is by renewing of the mind through tutorials on the concepts and principles of God's kingdom. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. The heart has the ability to think, reason, analyze, and make decisions. You can actually experience changes in your life if you know how to influence and direct your thoughts. Your inward thinking determines your outward experience. So you are not at the mercy of the elements of this world that seek to encroach upon your life. If you are able to master your thoughts, you will master your life. The happenings around you should not determine your moods and reactions. You can choose to determine your environment like a thermostat rather than read and respond to your environment like a thermometer. The events of your life play out of the repository of your heart. The change you desire in your life does not come from your connections and the things around you. You cannot effectively change your life by just trying to change your actions and things in your environment. Rather. 
you change your life by changing your mind and your thought process. If you give a loafer a million naira now, he will still end up a loafer if he is left to his former mindset. What you experience without will invariably align with what your condition is within. Water will always seek its level. Likewise, if a loafer begins to think, talk, and act abundance, his resources will measure up to his belief system in a matter of time. Your mind is the compass of your destiny. I heard Bishop David Abioye say some time ago, What you mind is what you find. Your heart condition determines your earth position. I challenge you to refuse every form of limitations imposed on you by circumstances and external elements. Magnify who you are in Christ and think on the word and its promises and provisions. You may not look like what the word says now, but don't allow temporal facts affect eternal truths of God's word. You may find yourself living in the garage today, but that doesn't make you a car. That your bank balance marks zero doesn't make you broke. No, you are looking at the wrong report to assess your financial status. The word says, when men are cast down, then thou shalt say there is a lifting up. And let the weak say, I am strong. You are not what men say you are, but you are who God says you are. The dream within you is superior to the drought around you. You are essentially a triune being. You are a trinity of sorts. The Holy Bible teaches that you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in an earth suit called the body. When God created man, he formed him from the clay and breathed into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. The breath of God represents the spirit in man. God had commanded Adam, saying, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest therefore, thou shalt surely die. When Adam ate of the tree in Genesis chapter 3, he actually died. His spirit died the instant death referred to in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, while his soul and body gradually degenerated and died with time. Interestingly, at new birth, it is the spirit that is birthed in perfection, while the soul and the body go through processes of renewal to share in the glory of the new life that is imparted into the spirit. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 your whole being is made up of your spirit, soul, and body. With your spirit, you are to worship God in truth. However, it is only the spirit that is rebirthed that can give God true and acceptable worship. Please note that the real you is not the figure you see when you stand before the mirror. No, the real you is invisible, your spirit. If you mix this up, it will grossly affect how you live, your decisions, choices, and lifestyle. Your life is more than meets the eyes. Your earth suit may carry you for 120 years and wear out in death, but the real you will live eternally, either in heaven or in hell. As you take time to clean up your body, nurture, dress, and decorate it, and engage in studies and trainings to mature your mind, you also need quality time to develop your heart. Your spiritual health is more important than your physical and or your mental health. In fact, it is the state of your spiritual heart that determines your outcomes in life. You can't go further than the state of your heart. It is impossible. It is possible to be born again, renewed in your spirit, and still a failure on earth if your heart is not developed. It is the position of your heart that determines your possessions on earth. Now watch this. When your spirit is rebirthed, God credits all benefits you will ever require for life and godliness into your account. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Having money in your bank account is no guarantee that your needs will be met if you lack access to join them from the account. It is one thing to have your account loaded, but quite another to know how to properly sign a check 
and present it at the appropriate quarters to make cash withdrawals. Until you know how to withdraw what is in your spiritual account, you cannot enjoy them here on earth, even though they are yours. It is your responsibility to work out through the engagement of your mind what God has worked into your spirit. Christ, in all His riches and glory, takes residence in your spirit at redemption. However, you cannot walk in the reality of this mystery until you do something about your soul. The scripture says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 What you don't know can't benefit you. From the foregoing, the place of knowing in this context is not your spirit but your heart. Your spirit can receive revelation from God, but it is with your heart that you seek the knowledge of His will which is already documented in the Holy Bible. If you want to change what happens around you, then alter what goes on within you. The heart is the core of the soul. Peter referred to it as the hidden man of the heart. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 4 It interfaces closely with the spirit of a man. The heart is so deep and hidden that its nature is not easily perceptible to the natural eyes. The nature of the heart can be so hidden that even the person is deceived by it. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. Not only does a man's heart deceive other people, it also deceives the one who owns it. Only God can search it out. You can't get at a man's heart by his vocal or facial expressions. Even a man's actions can be far from the motives of his heart. The scribes and Pharisees in Jerusalem accused Jesus' disciples of transgressing the tradition of the elders by not washing their hands before eating bread. In his response, Jesus called them hypocrites, linking to Isaiah's prophecy that, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew chapter 15 verse 18 They spoke as God's advocates, whereas they exalted their tradition above God's word. God is more concerned about the heart than with the lips. God is not impressed by degrees and pedigrees. God is not swayed by a man's outward appearance. He said to prophet Samuel, who was captivated by Eliab's royal stature, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 God does not anoint people based on their competences, status, vocabularies, dressing, and similar paraphernalia. His oil comes on people whose hearts are right. It is your heart that draws the oil. Perceptions of the Human Heart The heart of man is a mystery that cannot be understood or comprehended by man. It has an amazing ability not only to deceive second or third parties, but to also delude the man that possesses it. I'd like to briefly examine here what I term as the three levels of perception of the heart of a man. The first level is the perception of the man about himself. This can be very deceptive. There is a way every man feels he is right in a particular matter, whereas they may be in total error and delusion. Conflicts grow out of the hearts of a man or people who both believe they are right in their own stands. The scripture says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. The young man who despises the preacher and mocks at sin really feels he's right in his own eyes. The second dimension is the perception the man projects for others to see. Beyond whom a man knows himself to be, there is a personality he likes to project. A fraudster knows he is one, but he talks and walks to project himself as a man of integrity so as to prey on the unsuspecting. Every man, to some extent, lives behind some kind of mask or facade. We tend to enjoy making people believe we are what we are not. However, there is the place of discretion and patience which must not be confused with the above. This is where one surpasses ill feelings and pretends that all is well for this time being. The wise man said, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. In other words, 
A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 16. Such self-control is commended by God as expression of maturity and virtue. The third level of perception of a man is the real person that God knows him to be. All things are laid bare before God. Like we examine in the opening text, he searches the heart and knows all secret motives. You need God's grace and mercy to rightly assess a man's heart. You can only apply your heart to wisdom when God in his mercy unveils your heart to you. There are dangerous reptiles hiding in the coolness of the jungle that will only surface when flames are kindled. It's not the fire that created the hideous animals, rather, they were there before the fire came. The fire only pushed them out and revealed them. God in his wisdom releases his fires via his word and spirit to reveal the depravities of our hearts. One virtuous thing you can do to help yourself is to constantly pray and trust God to reveal your heart to you by the light of His Word and by His Spirit. Paul said, The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 You must pray like the psalmist. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Psalm 26 verse 2 That was the supplication of a man who had heaven's witness as one that is after God's heart. It is failure at this level of consecration that will make a man like Saul start so well and end so woefully. That man was right in the beginning of a journey does not guarantee approval at the end of the journey. Man changes. Samuel chided Saul, saying, When thou wast little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 17 Jesus said, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 Not he that started well. God wants to work with men with contrite and tender hearts. Don't become too confident in yourself. David, despite his testimony and exploits, still cried to God, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If you allow God to sort out your intentions, your actions will be right and acceptable. I cry to God as such daily. When I lead the church out in evangelism, I check, is it for me? to gain more popularity and human applause? It is possible to do the right thing wrongly, so I do a personal heart check before the Lord regularly. You must get your motives right in everything you do because God is more interested in your motives than in your motions. While we may impress men by our deeds and performances, God is pleased only by our motives. A gifted artist could impress us with angelic singing while in the eyes of God she is unaccepted because she was out for a show of self and not to minister or glorify God. God told Samuel the prophet, The Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Those who seek men's applause are appalling before God. The motive of your heart can make your most noble actions contemptible before God. As I conclude this chapter, I want us to examine what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. Matthew chapter 15 verses 16 through 20. A man is defiled by what goes on in his heart and not necessarily by what he engages with his body. The state of your heart will inevitably determine what you engage in. You don't need a gun to commit murder. Your heart does it. You don't need a sin partner to commit adultery or fornication. Your heart does it. You don't need to pick a thing that is not yours before you commit theft. 
your heart does it. So, murder, adultery, fornication, and theft are beyond actions. They are a reflection of the heart condition. Chapter 3. Where is your heart? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 9 through 10. The New Living Translation renders it thus. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 9 and 10. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 21. The location and condition of your heart are traceable to where your treasures are laid. The fall of Lucifer from his archangel's seat in heaven was due to a heart condition. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 1 and 2, verse 5 and 14 through 17. Once a man's heart becomes corrupted, his entire life and destiny begins to decay. The condition of your heart determines the condition of your life. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 30. A sound heart, as in the above passage, refers to your spiritual heart. The scriptures identifies a good number of the state or conditions of the human heart, which can readily be categorized into two, that is bad and good heart conditions. Some bad conditions of the heart. The stony heart the doubtful heart, the troubled heart, the sorrowful heart, the dross heart. Such heart has become insensitive and dull and unresponsive to God. The foolish heart, the broken heart. Such hearts are wounded. The straightened or narrow heart, the blind heart, the deceived heart, the condemned or guilty heart, the haughty or proud heart, the forward or pushy heart, the perverse heart, the fearful heart, the faint heart, the divided heart, the evil heart, the revolted or rebellious heart, and the heavy heart. Some good conditions of the heart are the pure heart, the humble heart, the honest heart, the good heart, the right heart, the open heart, the steadfast heart, the willing heart, the understanding heart, the merry heart, the perfect heart or whole heart, the upright heart, the established heart, and the wise heart. Spiritual Heart Examination Having listed some conditions of the heart, let us take a step further into how to examine the heart to know its condition at a point in time. How do you discern your heart? One, through the Word of God. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. 
Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 to 13. When God speaks, he brings about illumination. God's word has a character of revealing things that are hidden and locked up in men's hearts. This ministry of God's word will only benefit you if you are open and receptive to it. The word of God is likened to a mirror. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 The Word shows you who you are in Christ and convicts your shortfalls, converting you into the image of the Son. God's Word presents who we ought to be as guaranteed by God's provisions. As you look into the mirror of the Word, it contrasts you with what you are and calls you to necessary adjustments. 2. The Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit deals with our hearts by promptings and strong nudgings. The Holy Spirit has a ministry of conviction. A good conscience is alive and responsive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. It is needful to mention here that the Holy Spirit convicts and does not condemn. Conviction is bearing witness to what is wrong and empowering you to do what is right. On the other hand, condemnation is bearing witness to what is wrong and wearying or disarming you from doing the right thing. So, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is a blessing to the saints. Chapter 4 An Even Closer Look at Your Heart Condition The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 9 through 10 the New Living Translation renders Jeremiah 17, 9-10 thus, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. What we have been considering in the previous three chapters of this book is particularly important to the theme of this book. I perceive that the matter of the heart is more important than most people realize. It is my strong belief that the great deliverance and liberty we can ever enjoy in Christ is rooted in this subject matter. I found that the case with many Christians who suffer stagnation and disappointment is not that they are particularly bad, wicked or lazy people. What has bound them to mediocrity is not something major that they are doing wrong. Many people are suffering the devastating effect of what the scripture refers to as the little foxes that spoil the vine. The little things that people overlook are what overrule the joy of favors and blessings their souls long to have. These are the things that may keep one working so hard and getting so little in return, like the saying, working like an elephant and eating like an ant. The truth is that if you fail to effectively deal with heart issues, you will be in to fight frustrating battles. It is worth repeating here that God is a heart God. He deals with us on the platform of our hearts and not necessarily by what we do or do not do. I have met precious people who in the eyes of their folks are bad guys, but they are favored and blessed by God because their hearts are right before God. Needless to say, there are others who have learned to walk, dress, and address people with the right language who are still in bondage. God is not as moved by our actions as He is concerned with our intentions. God's attention is more in our intentions than in our moralities. Please make no mistake about my point here. Whilst our actions and deeds are certainly important in the scheme of affairs in our walk with God, our motivation for what we do is more important to Him. God gauges each one of us with his heart meter and determines our benefits and placements. Beloved, the heart is described as being desperately wicked and twisted. Only God has the ability to constantly cleanse and guard our hearts. Only God can examine, reveal, remove, and refill the contents of our hearts by his word and the Holy Spirit. Whenever God reveals you to you, it triggers a measure of discomfort, pain, remorse, or anger, as the case may be. We all at one point or the other have internal struggles with what I call aliens, 
These aliens, who we nicely refer to as heart conditions in other parts of this book, are monsters that are quite conflicting in nature to who we really are in our spirits as children of God. In standard conditions, some of us have tamed ourselves to act and react to situations in certain acceptable patterns. But when the STP, standard temperature and pressure, is no more standard, we find ourselves displaying disappointing attitudes that are totally strange and alien. Chapter 5. Guard Your Heart The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 9 and 10. The New Living Translation renders it thus. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 26. In the preceding chapters of this book, we have examined from the Word of God the nature, the operations, the behavior, and the dynamics of the human heart. It is my belief that what you have read thus far has well instructed you in the subject matter of this book. At this point, I perceive that there are still many things to discover on the matter of the heart. I am aware that what we have discussed thus far is not exhaustive and therefore pray that God will expand your knowledge and deepen your understanding on the few things we have considered. The subject of the human heart, if properly understood and adhered to, will be a catalyst of change and transformation to your life. It will definitely serve as a game changer in your life and in your walk with God. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 you have a personal responsibility to keep your heart and that must be done with all diligence. The term keep has a militant connotation implying you need to be forceful and strategic in dealing with your heart. The heart is not what you handle with levity. Like a soldier, you are to mount a garrison over your heart. To deal with the heart, you must engage the posture of a soldier guarding a treasure. God will never charge you to do something he has not empowered you to do. It is quite possible to guard the heart. In this chapter, we shall examine God's strategic approach to dealing with it. Cleaning up the heart, though not easy, is however possible. You might have failed in past attempts to deal with your heart condition, but don't give up on yourself. God has offered practical guidelines in His Word that, if adhered to, will help us to maintain a healthy heart condition. The scripture says, By strength shall no man prevail. There is a scripture methodology to it. You can only deal with your heart by subscribing to the ways God has spelt out in His Word. We must realize that no man can clean or keep his heart all by himself. To clean up the heart and build it up, we will consider two things. 1. Go for the Word My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 to 22 There are three fundamental levels of encounter with the word that is presented in the above scripture. The ear must be inclined to the word, the eyes must be fixed on the word, and the heart must keep the word. The Word of God imparts to the man who finds it at these three dimensions. You can only find what you look for. Jesus said, He that seeketh, findeth. You are not qualified to find without seeking. The pearls and jewels of God's Word that add value and beauty to men's lives and destinies are not found by casually poring over pages of Scripture. Gold is not found on the surface of the sand. You have to dig deep for treasure. There is demand for discipline, focus, and commitment to study of the Word if you want to assess its spirit and life. Cleaning up the heart is an art of hearing with the ear. 2. Keep a guard over your heart 
The gateways to your heart are your eyes and your ears, and to some degrees, your tongue. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 To keep your heart, according to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, means to guard and protect it. If you don't consciously guard your heart, it will be polluted. A polluted heart will be in continual struggle, bringing out both bitter and sweet waters. What you look upon and listen to seeps into your heart and regulates your thought pattern. You take command of your thoughts, therefore, by regulating what you see and what you hear. You can only succeed at keeping or mounting a guard over your heart by putting a check to what you see and hear. One of the saints that had a strong testimony of being right with God once said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Job chapter 31 verse 1 What preoccupies your thoughts is an indicator of where your heart is and its condition. What are your waking thoughts? What do you think upon in the day and before you resign to bed at night? You inevitably conform to the image and continuous considerations and thoughts of your heart. There is enormous power in what you see and what you hear. For this people's heart is grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Matthew chapter 13 verse 15, English Standard Version. The understanding of the heart begins with the hearing of the ears and the seeing of the eyes. Whatever you see, hear, and or say will eventually affect the condition of your heart. 3. Be of a contrite heart. To help our understanding of the principle I want to present here, let us consider an account of King David, the man that had God's witness as one that is after his heart against King Saul. One would think that the sin of King David was more grievous than the error of King Saul. The one preserved choice animals to sacrifice to God while the latter impregnated the wife of his staff and to cover his sin, killed the husband and married the woman. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go, and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the soil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verses 17 to 21 Consider the account closely. King Saul had obviously disobeyed God's command, but in the deception of his heart, he thought picking select items of the accursed things as sacrifices unto the Lord would be acceptable to God. But no, and he failed to acknowledge that God never asked him to take of anything from Amalek as sacrifice to him. At the point of Samuel's accosting King Saul, Saul was no longer small in his own eyes. Saul's attitude was appalling to God. King Saul's heart was not right because he was more concerned about people's acceptance of his leadership than he was of God's approval. In his confession, he said, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And in pleading with prophet Samuel, his concern was to be honored before the people. All that bothered King Saul was looking good before the people. On the other hand, King David committed adultery with the wife of one of his serving soldiers. After impregnating the lady, he organized the death of her husband at the battlefront and married the woman. When accosted by Nathan the prophet, King David was smote in his heart and he instantly confessed to the man of God, I have sinned against the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 13 That was when he wrote the psalm, Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Psalm 51 verses 1 through 3. The God we serve is a heart God. He relates with us through our hearts. He said to Isaiah the prophet, For all those things hath mine hand made, and those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 2. God delights to relate with a man who is of a poor and contrite heart, one that trembles at his word. You can choose to be tender, compliant, and malleable in the hands of God. God wants us to relate with him with a childlike faith and confidence in his word. Handling Heart Conditions There are common heart conditions that I deem necessary to specifically consider in this chapter. These include guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. In telling us about the source of evil things, Jesus said, Do not ye understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 through 20. Evil thoughts are the breeding ground for all other bad heart conditions. It is the mother of all bad heart conditions. What comes out of your mouth at any point in time proceeds from your heart. Your words are the vents of your thoughts. Your thoughts and your words are sides of the same coin. Your words are simply spoken thoughts. Your words are thoughts that are spoken, while your thoughts are words that are thought. Make your thoughts good and your words and actions will be good also. I believe that if we are able to deal with the mother, we can tame the production of her children. Furthermore, thoughts are not just what you are conscious of. There are thoughts in your conscious realm and there are others that are beneath your consciousness. There are things you do as a routine that simply proceed from beneath your consciousness. You don't necessarily consciously think and plan to execute them. In order to understand how the above heart conditions operate, you need to appreciate the dynamic of the relationship between a debtor, his debt, and the creditor. Guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy are fueled by the imbalance of the relationship between the debt, the debtor, and the creditor. For a debtor, the debt is always with him wherever he goes, and its burden can create discomfort between him and the creditor. The debtor tends to feel less than himself when in the presence of his creditor. It will take the debtor paying off what is owed or the creditor charitably writing it off for the relationship between them to smoothen out. Let's attempt dealing with the four hard conditions with the backdrop of the debtor, the debt, and the creditor. Dealing with guilt. Guilt says, I owe you something. Guilt is a feeling resulting from doing something deemed wrong to somebody. Every wrong we do can be viewed as an act of theft. It is robbing somebody else of what he deserves from us. The moment a man takes up what does not lawfully belong to him, some kind of alarm goes off in his conscience. This results in guilt. By wronging someone, the offender becomes a debtor. He has an account to settle with the offended. To undo the guilt, the offender goes about trying to do things to pacify the offended and relieve himself of the burden of his guilt. Sometimes, in trying to relieve oneself of the gnawing sense of guilt, there is a plateau where the one becomes helpless and perplexed. Some people carry guilt on issues that involve someone they cannot reach anymore. If guilt is not dealt with, it affects the way you relate with other people. Guilt will rob you of courage and boldness. You can free yourself from the sense of guilt by confessing your error to God and asking and pleading for His forgiveness and by seeking the forgiveness of the one you wronged or undoing the wrong deed where possible. Every time you do something wrong against a fellow human being, you have wronged God also. Joseph said to Mrs. Potiphar, who was luring him into an immoral act with her, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Genesis chapter 39 verse 9 Anger 
Guilt says, I owe you something, but anger, on the other hand, says, you owe me something. People get angry most commonly when they don't get what they want or think that they deserve. This could be legitimate or otherwise. In anger, the same debt, debtor, and creditor interrelationship exists. An angry person will always want to get even with somebody. The angry person thinks that the only way to take care of their bad condition is to get even or pay back their offenders. To him, the debt is cancelled when he gets even with the offender. Angry people lack joy and are irritable. Sometimes the cause of the outburst of anger is not known. Angry people pick on things that don't even seem to make sense. It is not the thing that makes them angry, it is the root of bitterness in their hearts that stirs it up in them. The answer to the various heart conditions mentioned in this book is at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is not a place you visit once and for all, rather, it is a place you go and choose to remain there. Paul well understood this concept when he testified, I die daily. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. In defining his term here, he said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. At the cross, Christ paid the price of all the debts we owe, are owed, and will ever owe. One of God's methods for the healing of our wounds and mending our brokenness is not to put a bandage over them. The searchlight of His Word and the workings of His Spirit can only discover and recover us when we open up to Him. When you go to God as you are, He responds by making you as you ought to be. Greed Guilt says, I owe you. Anger says, you owe me something. But greed says, I owe me. Greedy people believe that they deserve every good thing under heaven. They exude the attitude of grab all you can, can it, and sit on the can. They are the ones who are never satisfied. Their motto for living is me, myself, and I. Greedy people are continually wrestling with covetousness. They tend to be insecure about the future. They worry about things and are quite stingy and miserly. Greed is the most deceptive of the several heart conditions mentioned in this book. It is easy for you and I to identify someone who is struggling with greed, but very difficult for you to identify yourself as greedy. The truth is that greed deludes men to think that they are only being prudent. The thriving force of greed is fear and unbelief. Fear fuels greed. Jesus charged his disciples against greed, saying, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Your life is not measured by your acquisition and possessions. Covetousness is mothered by mammon. Covetousness makes it difficult for one to trust God. Those who struggle with greed find it difficult to walk in and by faith. Jealousy Jealousy is powered by the idea, God owes me. Jealousy springs from inordinate craving for the thing that someone else possesses. It is a feeling that makes one think he is more deserving than the one who presently has what he desires. Lurking in the heart of the jealous man is the belief that God is able to provide anything. Jealousy makes one think that God could if he would and places a charge against God for his present position. The jealous is not necessarily angry about what his neighbor possesses, which he could have had. Ironically, the root of his anger is not that the other person had it and he doesn't have it, but his anger is against God forgiving the other person instead of himself. People who are jealous are not just pining over what the other fellow has, they are angry against God. They feel it should have been me. Your heart condition affects relationships which God has ordained to enrich your life. For you to enjoy relationships with other people, you must deal with your heart condition and make it healthy. The first step towards recovery and restoration of a disease condition is diagnosis. A doctor who diagnoses a patient's deadly condition and fails to offer him further help would worsen the ailment. God reveals to redeem. God does not reveal your heart condition to you to condemn you. No, he unveils 
so that His grace can prevail and change you. As you engage the Word and the Holy Spirit, you will witness the inner change that brings about transformation in your experiences and destiny. As a rule, you must make a qualitative decision that your heart and life would be governed by the Word of God and the dictates of the Holy Spirit. Else, you could see yourself in the mirror of God's Word and fail to make necessary adjustments and so fall short before God. It is only such a heartfelt decision that can deliver you from the bad heart conditions that choke the life of your spirit and limits your possibilities as a child of God. Let God's Word be your final authority and code of ethics. Let the voice of God silence every argument and settle every doubt in your life. Chapter 6 How far do you want to go with God? And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God according to this promise raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. Acts chapter 13 verses 22 and 23. The eyes of the Lord are still running to and fro the entire globe to find a man after his heart. God wants to manifest his glory on earth, but he needs men whose hearts are right before him so that he can show himself strong on their behalf. God is on the lookout for his true seekers. It is interesting that while people are running into errors and deception in trying to locate God, God is on the other hand looking for some people. The Holy Bible records that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Genesis chapter 5 verse 24. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God, Hebrews 11.5. God himself testified of his pleasure in Enoch. God is glorified by such testimonies. God wants to testify of his love in your heart. He wants to boast of your affection towards him. The interests lurking in the hearts of many God-seekers today are too mundane and selfish. God is looking for those who really desire him and want to see his glory. It's time to graduate from elementary Christianity and begin to put God first in your affairs. God found David a man after his heart. With a right heart, you are in good standing to be found of him. David was a man who rated glory beyond gold. He placed God's kingdom before his personal needs. God witnessed, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. The will of God was paramount to David. Understanding the Grace of God There is a marked difference between those of us living under the dispensation of God's grace and those who lived under the law. The New Testament bears the banner of grace, while the Old Covenant bears the law. The Church of Jesus Christ has suffered misinformation and misdirection over the years on the subject of our consideration in this chapter. The Church has swung back and forth on both extremes of the subjects of the law and legality and the grace of God. God's grace is being abused and misused by many in our days. The law transferred a heavy burden and placed a yoke on those who lived under the old covenant. However, the law was given not for man to fulfill it, for it was impossible, but to show man how woefully sinful and helpless he is to walk in righteousness. The law reminds us that in our own flesh and by our abilities, we cannot satisfy God's demands. As it were, the law was a schoolmaster to point us to grace, the only hope for our depravity. The purpose of the law was to show man that he needed a savior. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Galatians chapter 3 verses 24 and 25. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 17 The new covenant is a covenant of grace where God, in his loving kindness, has made divine access possible and unfettered to man. We are charged to come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Salvation and access to God are not by works of righteousness but by grace, and this grace is drawn upon by the ticket of prayers. The Bible says, For my grace are ye saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The erroneous teachings on the subject of grace have done more harm to the believer than the extreme teachings on legalism. They are both spiritual poisons to the soul. Both doctrines have tendencies to turn the believer's attention from Christ to self. Legalism seeks to bring men under the bondage of the law with restrictions of do's and don'ts. It deducts from the efficacy of the finished work of Christ and seeks to add its own requirements to the atonement of Christ. It seductively takes the focus of the believer from the cross to the arm of flesh, which claims that man can save himself by what he does, what he wears, places he goes, what he drinks or eats, and so forth. But nobody can do anything to qualify him to stand before God, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. No man can secure God's attention by keeping the law. On the other hand, the abuse of grace indulges the believer to sideline the work of grace into self-indulgence. The teaching holds that because one is now born again and under grace, one can do anything and everything and get away with it. The false doctrine of eternal salvation posits that once a person is born again, such a person remains saved and safe no matter what he does or how he lives his life. This error has wrecked many churches in the West. The doctrine of cheap grace is a satanic dose of anesthesia to numb the conscience of believers to the dealings of the Holy Spirit. It makes wrong feel right and okay. It brings about what Apostle Paul referred to as the conscience seared with a hot iron. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 It is expedient to note here that the grace of God is an active spiritual force. Grace empowers man to do what he could not naturally do under the law. The assignment and purpose of the grace of God is not only to deliver you from sin, death, and destruction. It is also ordained to maintain a work in your life until you become more like Christ in character and charisma. Grace does not only take us from the bondage of Egypt, it equally takes us into the blessedness of Canaan. Grace is not an excuse for sin, no. Grace is no justification for a life that falls short of God's standard of holiness and sanctification. In essence, grace is God's divine enablement to do right and live right. The demands of God's grace are higher than the requirements of the law. For instance, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew chapter 5 verses 27 and 28 your intentions under grace are equivalent to actions under the law. In the law, you have to kill somebody for you to commit murder, but under grace, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15 For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. The essence of grace is well captured in the above text. Grace is a teacher, separating us from ungodliness and drawing us to righteous and godly living. Quite clearly, there are demands of grace and demands of the law. Whilst the law was strict and impossible to keep by those under it, the stakes and demands of grace are quite higher and yet easier to keep because grace engenders life and imparts virtue that makes obedience to its principles practicable. Walking in the grace of God is not as casual and flippant as some preachers would have us believe. God's standard over the ages has been clear. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, then ye shall all be peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. God is still seeking out a people unto himself, a peculiar people 
a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. The Apostle Peter puts it even more succinctly. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope for the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13 through 16. God has always wanted a separated people from the world. Wherefore he said, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 to 18. The Father wants us to be consecrated from the world system. It is important to ask yourself certain questions. What are your motivations for the things you do? Are you doing things simply because they are fashionable? If you look closely at the driving intentions of your heart, you may be amazed to discover that there are things you do just because they are being done around you. To some extent, the church has allowed the world system to take the lead and to dictate how we live our lives. We have not been as courageous to stand out, rather, we are more comfortable to blend in with the fads of the world. Standing out will attract mockery and even persecution from the ungodly. Somehow, we don't want to be judged as extremists or laughed at on the grounds of our stand for the faith. But we must wake up from our slumber. It's time to stand up for righteousness and purity. It's time to let the world around you know what you believe. It's time to stand for integrity in the workplace. It's time we let the world know what is right and what is wrong on our campuses. We must go against the evil trends that are eating up and sweeping away the integrity of our institutions. Greed and avarice has made many to compromise their stand for righteousness in various quarters. But the scripture clearly instructs, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. Beloved, true joy and peace are not tied to acquisitions and bank balances. Who you know and what you know are not determinants of your joy and peace. Jesus warned, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Your life is not measured by the chain of cars in your garage. Your pile of degrees and certificates don't recommend you before God. It is your intimacy with the living God that determines the worth and value of your life ultimately. It's an error for you to let the world classify you by what you drive, what you wear, where you live, and all such classification. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Daniel chapter 11 verse 32 When you truly know the Lord your God, you are in command of things. The generality of people only witness God's acts, but there are those He shows His ways. Notably, those who know His ways produce the acts. Beyond applying the principles of Scripture to get things your way, go for the prince of the principles. Don't shortchange yourself, beloved. Why settle down for the thirtyfold when you can enjoy the hundredfold measure with God? The path to the optimum yield in God may not be straight, leveled, and rosy, but it leads to sure haven. Those who subscribe to the optimum yield in their walk with God don't talk and cry for cars and houses, rather they go for glory. When you get to the point of truly seeking after God, the things of the earth lose their glamour and appeal to your soul. Let's push beyond sonship and servanthood to friendship with God. Let's get more intimate and interact with Him on the grounds of His agenda and purposes for the earth, rather than just on the platform of His promises to cater for us. A friend of God like Abraham will not only seek God because he needs an Isaac, but is excited and sold out enough to lay down Isaac if that is the Father's pleasure. As we close this chapter, I want you to respond to the poser, How intimate do you really want to get with your God? What is the motivation and intent for your attending church and doing all that you do there? 
Chapter 7 Going All the Way with God I believe these are the last days. We are in an hour when every believer should pursue God like never before because the kind of revival that God is bringing upon the face of the earth is such that has never been before. A man by name Charles Price in 1906 prophesied about the end time. He said, In the last days, Christ shall appear in mortal vessels again. Literally, people will see men as Christ walking on the streets. There will be a division in the church between those who are seeking God and those that God is seeking. It's your choice to be all that God said you will be. I have made up my mind and determined that I'll pant after him till I see him. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Acts chapter 13, verses 22 to 24. For the law was given by Moses... But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 17 Jesus came to fulfill the law and to introduce grace. Under the law, there were limitations, but under the dispensation of grace, God has literally opened the gate of heaven. The veil that separated the holy place and the holy of holies in the throne room has been torn apart. As Jesus rose from the grave, the Bible says the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. The implication is that we can now go boldly into the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Understanding Grace There is a pseudo or false grace. It's a concept of grace that is cooked up from the pit of hell. It's as cruel and dangerous as legality and the law. This cheap grace seeks to make one believe that by doing certain things, you will be qualified to have dealings with God. Nobody will ever be able to stand before God and beat his chest and say, I can stand before you because I did pray, fast, witness, and so on. We are saved by grace through faith. Pseudo grace serves in the hand of the devil as an anesthesia. It numbs your conscience so that your spiritual sensibility can no longer discern between right and wrong. There are people who are living in wrong today who actually think that their wrong is right. It's not the act that is the problem, but the fact that there's no sensibility after the act. The Bible describes it as having the conscience seared with hot iron. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and to run from worldly lusts. When you look into the mirror of the Word of God and you refuse to adjust, align, and conform to the Word, it will judge you. Cheap grace is what we should run away from. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace is empowerment to do right. The rule of measure of your wealth before God is neither your acquisition nor your degree. I believe that God is a God of abundance and prosperity, but what I don't believe is that men are to pursue after these things and not after God. When you pursue after them, you are like the Gentiles. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. When you pursue God, your blessings come to you without sweat. Blessings follow you as you follow Christ. A call to followership. There is a clarion call today for genuine believers. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. There is no limit to how far you can go in following after the master, but there are demands at every level. Salvation may be free, but it is not cheap. It's free to you, but at a very great expense to Jesus Christ. The call of God today is higher than your career or profession. 
the call of God is a higher calling. We are living in days as in the days of Noah, when some of the Lord's servants, just like I am doing through this book, will be sounding caution and repentance when several others are saying, peace, peace. God is saying sudden destruction will befall the unrepentant evildoer. Pitch your tent with God and not against him. If God resists you, <laughs> you're a dead man. If God fights you, you are finished. So choose to take sides with him no matter what and where it means you will be. Intimacy with God is the currency of heaven to measure your wealth and worth in the sight of God. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Luke chapter 12 verse 15 And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Daniel chapter 11 verse 32 When you have your priorities mixed up, it's a big problem. When you put the cart before the horse, it's a huge problem. You must come to a point in your walk with God when you say, I know of a truth it's all about Jesus. If Jesus is removed from the equation, it will be futile and a waste of time. To have God is the starting point of prosperity. If God did not spare his son Jesus Christ, how will he not with him also freely give us all things to enjoy? Romans chapter 8 verse 32 My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 26 Beyond anything else you can give to God, he is looking for your heart. Everything you have will definitely follow the path of your heart's craving. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. God does not need your treasure, but your heart. Don't seek to do things right, just give God your heart. This is not the same as when you responded to the altar call and asked Jesus to come into your heart. This is about daily consistent surrender to do His will in your thoughts, words and actions, no matter what it may cost you. God placed a demand on Abraham to offer Isaac his long-awaited promised son on the altar of sacrifice. Because Abraham's heart was totally given to God, he did not argue but immediately went on to sacrifice Isaac on the mountain of Moriah. Those who want to go far with God are totally yielded to his leading. Chapter 8 Building According to God's Master Plan God is the master conductor of your life. He is the one who knows how to take the notes that are out of tune and bring them into alignment with the notes that are in tune to bring about a harmonious or melodious tune out of your life and destiny. He is the potter and you are the clay. It must be a thing of joy to be reminded that God is the one who is building your life. I dare say you are under divine construction. The beauty of such a divine construction is that you're not just being built by one of the notable, proficient, and globally known construction companies, but rather, you are being built up by God Himself. You need to be comforted with the much assurance that God never begins anything that He hasn't already finished. He completes everything in eternity before He begins it in time. So, you're not a man's, church's, or your earthly father's project, you are God's project. And if you're indeed God's project, God is definitely mindful of what he's making out of your life. The builder is more interested in the building being built properly than the building itself. There is no amount of desire you have that can surpass the desire that God has for your life. As good as you think your plans are for your marriage, career, or business, those plans are insignificant in comparison to God's plan. God is in the process of building you up to become a spiritual habitation. The Bible declares in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 that you are a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and precious. Thank God that when men reject you, God can still choose you. God doesn't go choosing men among the nobles, wise, or the qualified. He rather chooses men that people think are not qualified for a particular job. That's why a sense of inability or a sense of divine ability is a qualification for God's call. 
The Bible declares that we are ministers of the gospel by the grace of God. He has made us able ministers of the New Testament. We are not ministers of our own ability and strength, but we were made ministers by grace. In like manner, when you look at your life and the various things that seem to be out of tune, you should look to God and tell Him, It's because of this you chose me. Men that God chose for certain assignments in the Bible were men who didn't look like it. God is building you up to become a spiritual home to offer up to Him spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to Jesus Christ. The building that God is building out of your life is a spiritual house, not a carnal house. God's original master plan for creating man was for man to conform to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God's dream and vision for your life is that you become a replica of Jesus on the earth. God designed you to experience certain degrees of glory while you are still here on earth. God is desirous to raise men who will display the fullness of the stature of Christ while they are still here on earth. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. First and foremost, he foreknew you. He knew about this day in your life. Then he predestinated you to conform, agree, or align with the image of his Son. He wants you to resemble Jesus in totality and capacity. God's purpose for you is to be transformed that you become one with him. The Bible says in Obadiah that Savior shall come up on Mount Zion. This speaks of nothing but Christ-like maturity. I want you to understand that salvation is not a bid-off for believers, but it's the beginning. There is much more to the kingdom than salvation. God desires that you walk so intimately with him that you'll be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. Jesus is our forerunner our template and our example to follow. You ought to desire spiritual maturity and growth to the point where men see Christ in you. That is the very intent and desire of God. God's intention when he got you born again was for you to grow beyond accepting Christ at an altar call to grow to maturity. Paul said, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 There comes a point in your walk with God that you put away childish things and begin to give ministry instead of waiting to receive ministry. There are certain things that God will not place in your hands until you become a son indeed. That is the scepter of authority, rulership, and dominion. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Galatians chapter 4 verse 1 The scepter of authority and dominion is not for the immature, but for sons. Paul referred to the immature as babes and carnal. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. A carnal Christian is simply one who is more conscious of the natural world than he or she is of the spiritual and the supernatural. You are carnal if you are ruled by the elements of this world, moved only by what you see, hear, feel, touch, and handle. Sons respond to the promptings of the Spirit of God. You should not make decisions based on your environment, failing to understand that there is more to life than meets the eye. Everything seen, heard, felt, or touched can be changed. Only the things that are in the realm of the spiritual are eternal. Every other thing is temporal and susceptible to change. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. 
The moment you say yes to Jesus Christ, your search, desire, and pursuit need to change. You ought to begin to seek things above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things which are above and not on things on the earth. When you prioritize the things of God, God will also hold you in priority. Jesus asked his mother, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? The things of the kingdom are real business. The word business has to do with profitability. You should have a sense of profiting with the things that God has put in your hands by way of stewardship. There's nothing that you have that belongs to you. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job chapter 1 verse 21 This is a reminder that you cannot carry anything out of this world, but you are simply a steward of all that God gives you. Paul said we are stewards of the mysteries of God. So, you are a custodian of the things God graciously places in your hands. They don't belong to you. The moment you change your mindset from ownership to stewardship, God can trust you with much more. A Sure Foundation One of the fundamental things that relate to building, not just for time but for eternity, is having a sure foundation. If your foundation is not sure, when the flood comes, your building will come tumbling down. The foundation is the most important part of any building because its strength and fortitude determines the solidity of the building. Those who build under an unsure foundation may build seemingly quickly to the applause of many, but when the rain, the flood, and the wind come, they will suffer shame. Is your foundation solid enough to guarantee the kind of weight that God is about to put on your shoulders? When glory moves into a room, it carries a weight and those who don't have a solid foundation will be crushed under the weight. No wonder the Bible says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 It's the blessing of God not to allow you to continue building when the foundation is faulty. It's a blessing from God to stop your project so that He can attend to your root because it's your root that will determine what fruits you can bear. Whilst you may prefer Him to allow the continuation of your building project despite the faulty foundation, it is a blessing that He put it on hold though others seem to be moving fast ahead of you. I know it seems like an unjustifiable delay, but the master builder knows better. He knows your end from the beginning and so the Bible admonishes that we be in subjection to Him. God's chastisements may not be joyful now, but they will yield peaceable fruits of righteousness in the end. For the height that God wants to take you, He allows certain things to come to be that He may redesign your substructure. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 21. The above scripture is a description of a carnal Christian who has failed to spend time with the Spirit. A carnal Christian stands in enmity with God. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 Carnality is not fun. It's something to be fought. It's something to cry to God about for deliverance. The flesh can never be cast out as a demon. The flesh can only be crucified. Nothing satisfies than to have God's glory. Life is not just about existence on earth. It's about fulfilling God's master plan. Do you know what has been written concerning you? Your answer holds the key to a life of fulfillment.
Many have life but lack peace and fulfillment. When God gives you life, He gives you peace, the peace you can experience in the midst of a storm. When you are in covenant with God, you will know what to do to turn a bad situation around. You will damn the inferno of any satanic fire and dare the lion's den. You will celebrate when bad seems to be turning to worse because you know it is God's therapy for reversal. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 You must strive to grow up spiritually to the point where you arrive at Christ-like maturity. God has a master plan. He is never casual or haphazard about anything. Rather, He is very deliberate, intentional, and He always begins whatever He begins with a clear purpose. Before He designed the world, He had a master plan. He had a very clear architectural blueprint. He knew the world He wanted to create before He ever started creation. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24. When God thinks, it stands. When He purposes, it comes to pass. The thoughts of God precede manifestation. There is a master plan. The master plan speaks of the original intention, desire, and blueprint of the creator or manufacturer. The reason many people have a faulty structure is because they fail to look at the master plan. There is a master plan for every area of your life, and that master plan is found in the Word of God. When you find God's plan for your life in His Word, a renewed sense of boldness rises within you. God has a master plan for your life. Don't make your life an experiment. Until God speaks, wait. It was said concerning John the Baptist that he was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Luke chapter 1 verse 80 it pays to wait. Those who wait on God don't wait in vain. They wait for His time, strength, and His word. Speed is never synonymous to victory. The journey is not determined by how fast you arrive at your destination, but how well you're running the race. How do you guarantee that you are not building according to your own pattern? By simply taking the time to consult the master builder to give you his blueprint. You must be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Psalm 127 verse 1 In the creation story, the Godhead conferred together and said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and the creatures on the land. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 before they made man, they conferred. A plan is typically an idea well thought out. Many times when a plan is so clear, it is almost equal to the existence of the structure. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Genesis chapter 11 verse 6 That is how strong a master plan can be. As far as your eyes can see, a master plan is crystal clear. God always has a master plan for everything He does. He said to Abraham, As innumerable as the stars are, so shall thy seed be. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 The master plan that God has for you is that you would conform to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. God is challenging you to go beyond the place where you've been, where you're engrossed with your needs and fail to understand that God has needs. There are certain things that God has in mind by way of His blueprint for mankind. He desires that all men come to repentance and get saved. He desires to see His kingdom come upon the face of the earth. What you have to do is to ask Him what to do to participate in meeting His needs. Children demand, sons give. It is better to be made by God than to take from God. When you are built up as a spiritual house, you offer up spiritual sacrifices. It's time to go beyond using God 
to loving and pleasing Him. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Psalm 37 verse 4 Chapter 9 The Holy Spirit Understanding His Person And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John chapter 14, verses 16 to 19 and 26. It is absolutely vital in these last days that you understand how to walk, flow, and operate in the Holy Spirit. You must know how to walk with the Holy Spirit and be continually guided by Him. Quite understandably, the Holy Spirit is the most important personality of the Godhead on earth today, yet He is the most misunderstood and neglected by many today. I once heard someone say that if the Holy Spirit were to be removed from our churches today, many activities will continue to be carried out as before with many people not being able to recognize any difference. What some people do in the name of being led by the Spirit today is actually expressions of the flesh. The church has so mastered the art of administration and protocols to the degree that she has almost organized the person and the power of the Holy Spirit out of her gatherings. While we thank God for the order and excellence in our service structures, we should be dependent on the Holy Spirit and allow Him to move as He pleases among His people. We must allow Jesus to be Lord indeed in our gatherings. How we need to be conscious that as two or three of us gather in His name, He is there in our midst as He promised. I believe that believers need training in their walk and relationship with the Holy Spirit so that they are not tempted to be overboard or lean to the flesh when the Spirit moves. By training, I mean understanding of His person and His ways. The danger and challenge the church has faced since her birth is the temptation to swing from one end of the pendulum to the other extreme. The church switches from one end of legalism to the other end of fanaticism. We've had people who were cut and dry and had no room for the Holy Spirit and others who in the name of being in the Holy Spirit have lost decorum with people rolling on the floors, moaning like cats and dogs. We must strive by the help of the Holy Spirit to find the balance on how to walk and move with Him without being legalistic or fanatical. Whilst there is clearly an abundance of falsehood regarding the move of the Holy Spirit among believers today, there is definitely the genuine and mighty move of the Spirit of God among His people. The falsehoods do not deter or disannul the genuine works of the Holy Spirit among men. The presence of the fake should not prevent us from pressing and persevering for the genuine move of God in our time and generation. The promise is unto us for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. God has ordained prophetically that in these last days the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We are certainly in the days of fulfillment of prophetic scriptures. You are to decide not to be left behind in this move. There have been diverse visitations of this kind in the past. The Azusa revival, the Welch and Scotland revivals are all historic events of the Spirit's outpouring. This time it's not about reading histories, but making history. If we do what is requisite, we can birth the revival that is eminent. Heaven is enlisting and inducting men into the army that will be at the front line of this new move of the Spirit. Prophet Joel described this army as a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Joel chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. 
Enlistment in this army calls for a training, exercise and development in walking with and in the Holy Spirit. There is a call for maturity in the Spirit. I believe that is why God is giving us strong thirst to build and develop greater levels of intimacy with Him and the person of the Holy Spirit. You must come of age to lay aside the mundane things and begin to seek after the things of eternal value. Paul said, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's time to put aside things of childishness and grow more into Christ-likeness. If you must partake of this end-time move, you must desire and commit yourself to pursue this level of walk with the Holy Spirit. Why intimacy with the Holy Spirit? Primarily, the Holy Spirit is the executive officer of the church today. He is entrusted with definite responsibilities over the Church of Christ. He is charged by the Godhead to carry out the plan of God for this generation. He is to see to it that the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The Father and the Son are seated in heaven, but the Holy Spirit is presently here on earth. Someone may say, Jesus is with me, he dwells in my heart. But in reality, it is the Holy Spirit that indwells you to glorify Jesus. Jesus is seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity the church is to deal with today. If you don't understand him, you will run into trouble here on earth. His leading is your security and access to a glorious life. You need to know him personally. Jesus did tell us while he was here in the flesh that he would have to go away to make room for the Holy Spirit to come. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. John 16 verse 7 Jesus says it is more profitable or advantageous for us that he goes for the Holy Spirit to come unto us. We stand to gain more benefits from the person of the Holy Spirit today than the disciples got from Jesus while he was here in the flesh. The going away of Jesus Christ is not what is most beneficial, rather it is the condition of his sending the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was with us, he could only be with us. He had geographical limitations. We could only be with him at a particular place per time. But the Holy Spirit comes to be in us. We all can now enjoy fellowship with him at the same time anywhere we may be. This, Jesus says, is more beneficial for us. As a consequence, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. John chapter 14 verse 12 One Jesus walked the face of the earth over 2,000 years ago, but after his sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection, the Father birthed several Jesuses by the operation of his Spirit in the hearts of men. So, on the face of the earth, Jesus is seen in manifestation by his Spirit in men in Japan, Ukraine, Germany, Canada, Nigeria, and everywhere in the world at the same time. The Holy Spirit is in you. The greater joy is that He is to abide with you forever. The problem we face today is that many individuals don't know what is in them. To help your appreciation of this subject, we shall consider three broad aspects of the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the power of the Holy Spirit. The understanding of one of these aspects helps you to progressively understand the other. Unfortunately, many people want to experience his power, but care less about his person or his presence. Your foundation in experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit is built on understanding his person. The Person of the Holy Spirit In our local parlance, we talk about my personal person, which implies an intimate relationship with someone. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. By that, He is God. He is neither an it, a thing, or an emotion. Rather, He is a person. In my opinion, the King James Version of the Bible missed a vital essence when it referred to Him as Holy Ghost 
instead of Holy Spirit. He is better called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit being God is not less important, less powerful, or less anointed than the Father or Jesus Christ the Son. The three of them are one and are on the same platform just as your spirit, soul, and body are one and represent you as one human entity. He is, however, distinct from the Father and the Son because of His unique expressions and ministry. The Trinity is a mystery. Understanding it is by revelation, but we try to help by applying some simple illustrations. For instance, water is liquid. But if it is refrigerated at below zero degrees centigrade, it becomes solid ice. Now, if the same water is heated up, it can evaporate as steam or gaseous element. These three states represent water under different conditions. The original state of water could be considered as God the Father. The iced state, where it becomes solid and concrete, could be considered as Jesus Christ, while the steam state can be considered as the Holy Spirit. Like gas, the Holy Spirit is not visible, but His impact is felt. So, the Godhead is one person, but with three unique expressions. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 All through Scripture, you find the persons of the Godhead being expressed from time to time in particular events and episodes. At creation, we see God the Father, God the Son, the spoken word, and God the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the deep. Also, we find the distinctness of the three persons of the Godhead well expressed in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, when the angel said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Again, we see the three persons of the Godhead active at the same time in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We also find the three of them active at the same time in the healing ministry of Jesus Christ as recorded in the Gospels. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. The three persons of the Godhead are also seen active at the resurrection of Jesus. The Father was in heaven, the Son was in the grave, and the Holy Spirit quickened the Son from the dead. Romans chapter 1, verse 4 and chapter 8, verse 11. However, there are also instances where just one of them is predominantly active. Thank you for listening. Apostle Goodhart, as he's fondly known, serves as the apostolic lead of Horn of Revival Ministry Horn, a global outreach ministry with the mandate to carry the torch of revival across nations. He is also the lead pastor of Revival House of Glory International Church, Rogic, the church expression of Horn, a fast-growing prophetic church with headquarters in Abuja, Nigeria. He is a prolific writer with over 30 books, including the classic titles, Revival is Here Again, Catch the Fire, and Living in the Father's Love Zone. Apostle Goodhart is a mentor to many and a well-traveled, astute teacher of God's Word. Passionate about raising a new generation of leaders, he hosts two outreach programs, Bethel Ministers and Leaders Conferences, BEMIL, and Winning Today on Campus, which in over a decade has positively affected several thousands of ministers, leaders, professionals, and young people for the Lord. He is the host of the weekly insightful and inspirational radio program, Winning Today, and the television broadcast, Revival is here again with Pastor Goodhart. 
He hosts the wave-making online Global Prophetic Prayer Altar, GPPA, which airs on www.rogic.radio.org and other media platforms. He is happily married to Pastor Abimbola Ekweme, his life partner and best friend, and they are blessed with three lovely sons and a beautiful daughter. Thank you again for listening. You can contact us at www.rogic.org or on all our social media platforms at Apostle Goodhart.